Congressman Paul, a number and a time frame and an idea? My uh, approach is slightly different, where I think all for less taxes and less regulations, we recognize this. But I emphasize the fact that you have to know why we have a recession and why we have an unemployment before you can solve the problem. And the, the financial bubbles are created by excessive credit and stimulation by the Federal Reserve. And then you have bubbles and you have to have a correction. This stimulus creates excessive debt and malinvestment. As long as you don't correct that and you maintain the debt and the malinvestment, you can't get back to economic growth again. Unfortunately, so far, what we have done is we have not liquidated the debt. We have dumped the debt on the American people through TARP funding and as well as the Federal Reserve. So the debt is dumped on the people. And what did we do? We bailed out the people that were benefiting during the formation of the bubble. So as long as we do that, we're not going to have economic growth. We did the same thing in the Depression. The Japanese are doing it right now. So it's time we liquidate the debt and look at monetary policy and then, of course, lower taxes. And I would like to do in the first year, cut $1 trillion because that is the culprit. Big spending and big government. I want to move on, if I can, to another question which represents some of the urgent and tough choices presidents have to make because this one is coming up soon, December 31st, and it is the payroll tax cut. And as we know, the payroll tax cut, which funds the Social Security uh, fund in this country, is part of the argument, part of the debate, part of the consideration about the economy in this country right now. And by some estimates, if this tax cut expires on December 31st, it could add as much as $1,000 to the tax burden of American working families. And I know you are divided down the middle. Congressman Paul, 30 seconds for bottle to send it. Well, well I want on. to uh, extend the tax cut because if you don't, you raise the taxes, but I want to pay for it. And it's not that difficult. In my proposal, my budget, I want to cut hundreds of billions of dollars from overseas. Uh, the trust fund is gone, but how are we going to restore it? We have to quit the spending. We have to quit this being the policeman of the world. We don't need another war in Syria and another war in Iran. Just get rid of the embassy in Baghdad. We're pretending we're coming home from Baghdad. We built an embassy there that cost a billion dollars, and we're putting 17,000 contractors in there and pretending our troops are coming home. I could save the okay, money, let's, and let's, we don't have to raise taxes on Social Security uh, on, on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on the tax. I want to bring Congressman Paul in on this, because, uh, Congressman, you've been running ads that are quite tough. Quite on, right. Quite tough on Speaker Gingrich here in Iowa this week, accusing him of, quote, and this is a quote from your ad, serial hypocrisy. Why do you think Speaker Gingrich is a hypocrite? Well, he's been on different positions, you know, on so many issues, you know, single payer. Uh, he's taken some positions that are not conservative. Uh, he, he supported the TARP funds. And uh, the other thing that really would annoy, should have annoyed a lot of people, he received a lot of money from Freddie Mac. Now, Freddie Mac is essentially a government organization. While he was earning a lot of money from Freddie Mac, I was fighting over a decade to try to explain to people where the housing bubble was coming from. So Freddie Mac gets bailed out by the taxpayers. So in a way, Newt, I think you probably got some of our taxpayers' money. They, they got taxes, they got money on, they're still getting bailed out. But uh, you're a spokesman for them and you receive money for them. So I think, uh, I think this is uh, something that uh, the people ought to know about. But there's been sure. many positions, and you have admitted many of the positions where you have changed positions. But, uh, you know, if you were looking for a consistent position, you know, I, I think there's uh, be a little bit of trouble anybody competing with me on consistency. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, as you say in your own, normally in your own speeches, the housing bubble came from the Federal Reserve inflating the money supply. Now, that's the core of the housing bubble. And I happen to be with you on auditing the Fed and, on, on, on frankly, on firing Bernanke. Uh, second, I was never a spokesman for any agency. I never did any lobbying for any agency. I offered strategic advice. I was in the private sector. And I was doing things in the private sector. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Uh, uh, and, and, not the private sector. And, and when you're in the private sector and you have a company and you offer advice, like McKinsey does, like a bunch of other companies do, you're allowed to charge money for it. So what about it? It's called free enterprise. It's the taxpayers' money, though. We had to bail these people out. Should voters consider marital fidelity when making their choices for president? Congressman Paul, what's your view on this? 
You know, I think character is obviously uh, very important. I, I don't think it should be necessary to have to talk about it. I think it should show through in the way we live. And I think it should show through in, in your marriage. And I happen to have been married for 54 years and a fa family person. But I don't think we should have to talk about it. But you know what probably is, every bit is important. If, if your marriage vows are important, what about our oath of office? That's what really gets to me. That's where you're really on the line as a public figure. And that's where I think a lot of people come up real short because there's many times that I've been forced to Congress because I take my oath very seriously. I end up sometimes, believe it or not, voting all by myself, thinking that why aren't they people paying attention? Why don't they read Article 1, Section 8? You know, if, if we took that oath of office seriously in Washington, we'd get rid of 80% of the government, the budget would be balanced, we'd have sound money and we would have prosperity and we wouldn't be the policemen of the world, we wouldn't have a federal reserve system and we wouldn't be invading the privacy of every single individual in this country with bills like the Patriot Act. We'd have a free society and a prosperous society. Speaker Gingrich caused something of a stir overnight in the Middle East with comments he made in an interview with the Jewish Channel in which he called the Palestinians an invented people. And uh, I just wondered, uh, Congressman Paul, if I can start with you, do you agree with that characterization that the Palestinians are an invented people? No, no, no I don't agree with that. And that's just stirring up trouble. And I, I believe in a non-interventionist foreign policy. I don't think we should get in the middle of these squabbles, but to go out of our way to say that so-and-so is not a real people. Technically and historically, yes, uh, you know, under the Ottoman Empire, the Palestinians didn't have a state, but neither did Israel have a state then, too. But th this is how we get involved in so many messes, and I think it just fails on the side of uh, practicing a little bit of diplomacy, getting ourselves into trouble, mentioning things that are unnecessary, the people in those regions should be dealing with these problems. We shouldn't be dealing with these things. But uh, historically, it, it uh, you know, under the Ottoman Empire, that is, that is uh, t technically uh, correct. But to make these decisions and deciding what the settlement is going to be should be the people that are involved. This idea that we can be the policemen of the world and settle all these disputes, I mean, Soon we'll have to quit because we're flat out broke, but we, we cannot continue to get into these issues like this and, uh, and, and, and getting ourselves into more trouble. We have a question on Yahoo about the last time those of you had a personal financial strain that forced you to cut back on a necessity, as so many people in the middle class say they do. What were the consequences your fa you faced, and will you weigh in on that? Congressman Paul, what does this question evoke? Uh, how much does it matter to have had personal experience? Well, I feel very fortunate because uh, although I was raised in, in a system, in a family, it was rather poor, but we, I didn't even know it. Uh, you know, it was during the Depression, World War II, and we didn't have very much, and I worked my way through college, and that was a natural instinct because that's what you were supposed to do. But uh, I, I, I finally did a little bit better in medical school because I had my wife work our way through college, medical school. <laughs> so that worked out a little bit better. But middle class is something. Suffering. But not only because we bail out the rich and dump on the poor and they lose their jobs and they lose their houses, but there's a characteristic about monetary policy. When a country destroys its currency, it transfers wealth from the middle class to the wealthy. And this is what you're seeing today, the elimination of the middle class. And it's going to get a lot worse unless we address the subject overspending, overborrowing, and printing too much money and understanding the business cycle. Senator Santorum. switch to this question and and it is about health care because a number of people in fact I was just at a pharmacy here I do have a cough but I was at a pharmacy here in Iowa and the pharmacists were talking about a big driver of health care costs and they specifically mentioned habits unhealthy habits that we all need to learn to do better on at a young age. They talked about obesity, they talked about exercise. If I can ask you, Congressman Paul, anything government should do on these fronts? On, on medical? Or? On these fronts specifically of healthy 
behavior at very young at ages where it's no essentially not but they have to be a, a referee if people are doing things that hurt other people yes but if you embark on instituting a society where government protects you from yourself you're in big trouble and that's what they're doing I think what we've had here is a demonstration of uh, why should we have a candidate that's going to have to explain themselves. Seventy percent of the people want further explanations on what your positions are. So I think that is endless. But you talk about the, uh, the, the Obamacare using force. But that's all government is, is force. I mean, do you have a choice about paying Medicare taxes? Uh, so there's not a whole lot of difference. You're forced to buy insurance. That's one step further. But you have to stop with force. Once government uses force to mold behavior or mold the economy, they've overstepped the bounds and they violated the whole concept of our revolution and our constitution. As a form of closing statement, we just want each of you, you're all running against each other, but in these last few minutes, if you stick to the minute, we will not run over the commercial. <laughs> Tell us the one thing you've learned from someone else, one of your challengers on stage. Governor Perry. I tell you, Congressman Paul got me really intrigued with the whole, uh, the Federal Reserve. And I've spent a substantial amount of time reading about, and Currency Wars, the book by James Ricard, it, uh, uh, but Congressman Paul is, is, is the individual on the stage that got me most interested in a, in a subject that I've found to be quite interesting and at the root of a lot of the problems that we have, and I thank you for that. But the one thing that I've found uh, outside of, of these fine uh, individuals on this stage is that the people of this country, the people of this country really want to get America back on track. I, I always find uh, the principle of leadership to be most interesting. And, uh, and as I look at the people on the stage, each exhibits different qualities of leadership, and they've each exercised leadership in different ways. One of the things about uh, Ron Paul that always amazes me is when I come to a debate like this, the only signs I see are the Ron Paul people out there in freezing, <laughs> freezing, freezing, yeah. And freezing temperatures are always there. He ignites an enthusiasm with the number of people that's very exciting to watch. I have learned that you should never give up on your opposition because if you're persistent and you present your case, they will come your way. So, Rick, I appreciate it. <laughs> Rick, I appreciate it. Michelle, I appreciate it. You're open to the Federal Reserve. That is wonderful. But I, I, I work from the assumption that freedom brings people together. And if you understand freedom, it's based on tolerance and nonviolence. So if it's tolerance, it should be bringing all kinds of people together, and that's following our Constitution. We shouldn't be fighting among ourselves, because we shouldn't be fighting in Washington. If we all take the same oath of office, where does the fight come from? Somebody is messing up somewhere. So, so, so I would say that with persistence, I think that we can all prevail and come up with the right answers.